Well, just to uh, be mindful of our time, I see that uh, we have a, a good amount of folks into the session. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for taking some time today to uh, watch our uh, vaccine education webinar number two. Uh, my name is Fernando and I'm with the Region 9 Head Start Association. And I'm excited to be your webinar host for this afternoon's session. So uh, if you have any questions or uh, experience any issues uh, using Zoom, uh, feel free to use the Q&A box uh, and submit your comments, your questions, and I'm happy to monitor that and, and work behind the scenes to uh, assist you in any way that I can. Uh, just so you know, today's session uh, will be recorded and will be made available on demand uh, within roughly 24 to 48 hours. A, uh, up on our YouTube channel, you'll find a link uh, to watch the recording. Um, a follow-up email will go out to all registered participants to make sure uh, once that uh, once the recording is ready, uh, you're you're good to go to watch it. So you'll receive an email from us uh, in 24 to 48 hours. Um, now, uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce Edward Condon uh, for some uh, opening comments, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Take it away, and I, I hope that uh, you enjoyed the session this afternoon. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Fernando. Appreciate your assistance with the webinar today, and welcome to all of you who have joined us. Looks like we have about 300 folks on the line here, and we encourage you to let us know where you're uh, coming from. So put that in the Q&A. It's always good to know uh, the reach the association has. As Fernando shared, this is our second uh, vaccine education webinar. We uh, plan to do three, so we have one more coming up in in March. Uh, the first that we did in January is available up on the YouTube channel for you to watch. Uh, today's our second, and that'll be recorded and put up there shortly. Our third, which will be March 18th, uh, which presents Dr. Josh Green from uh, the Hawaii, who is the Lieutenant Governor there and also an ER physician, as well as we'll be having additional guests uh, join us to bring in different perspectives of uh, vaccine education. Uh, the reason the Regional Association is so interested in presenting this information is to really strengthen your knowledge, equip you to do two things. One, to really make your own personal choices around vaccine education, uh, and two, to be able to guide those who look to you as a trusted source, whether that be your own family, uh, the children enrolled in your program, parents, and community members. We know that Head Start agencies, early Head Start agencies, really hold the trust of families. And so it's an opportunity for you to strengthen your own knowledge as well as be prepared for those who may be more hesitant as we move through this vaccine education stage of COVID-19. So today's uh, webinar is really here in cooperation with Head Start California, and I should say collaboration with Head Start California, in particular their workforce uh, committee, uh, which is led by Dahlia Vicente from UCLA Early Head Start. And we are appreciative to her work, the committee's work, and of course, Head Start California for their collaboration on this project. And I'd like to introduce at this time, uh, Christopher Miracle from Head Start California. Chris? Thanks, Ed. Uh, Christopher Miracle, Head Start California. Glad that you're with us today. And I think we all know why we're here. Uh, the pandemic has claimed a half a million American lives, and I suspect that if it has not touched your family, uh, you know a friend or a colleague who, who has lost someone. Uh, the speed of our recovery from the pandemic is being driven by a lot of factors and many of those factors are beyond our control. But what is totally within our control is how much we learn and share. We have the ability to collect and disseminate accurate and valuable information about the vaccination that would build confidence in every community to do everything we can to get past it. And as Ed said, our Head Start community is a trusted messenger. And the more we arm ourselves with good information, the more we can directly contribute to the health of our communities. So uh, I want to thank Ed and his team at Region 9 Head Start Association for logistically pulling all of this together and echo his thanks uh, to the uh, Head Start California's Workforce Development Committee and the committee chair Delia Vicente at UCLA Early Head Start uh, for making this a priority. And after this webinar, we will all collectively follow up with a campaign of informational flyers for all of us to share through our respective communication channels. And finally, a special thanks to our panelists from UCLA for the gift of their time and expertise. And to introduce that panel, I will pass the virtual mic back to Ed. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, thanks, Chris, and thanks for the work of Head Start California representing us so well here in Sacramento and beyond. 
So we have a wonderful panel for you today to hear from, each bringing a unique perspective of information uh, to you. And again, we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A. And as we finish up our presentation today, we'll be bringing those questions back up and trying to answer them as best as we can. So you'll hear from four individuals. First, you'll hear from Dr. Peter Salagi, who's a pediatric health services clinical researcher with an overall mission to improve access to health care, quality of care, and health outcomes for children. Uh, and he's, uh, as they all are, with the UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital. Uh, second, you will hear from Dr. De St. Maurice, uh, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Disease and leads to pediatric infection control and is the co-chief infection prevention officer for UCLA Health. A third, you'll hear from Dr. Garner. Dr. Garner is an associate clinical professor and director of the clinical microbiology at the UCLA Health System. And then fourth, we'll hear from Dr. Mora Salagi, a primary care pediatrician, advocate, educator, and professor of pediatrics at UCLA. Uh, she has devoted her career to caring for underserved, vulnerable children, especially children and adolescents in foster care. She has an expertise in childhood trauma, resilience, parenting, and attachment. So wonderful panel. Thank you all for your time today. So why don't we go ahead and get started with Dr. Peter Salagi. So before I start, I do want to say, um, I think I speak for all of us that I think those people, you all who take care of young children and especially vulnerable children, you are in the most noble profession of all. Um, and uh, as a pediatrician, I share a kindred spirit with you all. So I congratulate you for your profession and thanks for listening to us. Um, so what I would like to do today is to talk um, about COVID-19 vaccines, the vaccine rollout, vaccine hesitancy, <clears throat> and then pediatric COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we'll be done by 10 o'clock tonight, so don't worry about it. So next slide, please. So before I start, I do need to just mention the massive um, morbidity and uh, mortality that has occurred. Um, the good news is that there's a significant drop in number of cases. This is US data as of yesterday. And there's a significant drop in deaths across the United States. Um, but obviously, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we've had 28 million cases and half a million uh, deaths already. And in California, 3.4 million cases and 50,000 deaths almost already. So next slide, please. So what about the vaccines? Um, there are uh, several vaccines that are in the pipeline. As you know, there's two, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine that were approved in December. The Janssen vaccine <clears throat> is being evaluated this Friday and will likely be approved by next week. That's a single dose vaccine. The other two are two dose vaccines. There's a Novavax vaccine that may be coming later in the spring and an AstraZeneca vaccine that you probably heard a lot about um, which maybe in April or May uh, will be reviewed by ACIP. Next slide, please. All right, I'm, um, I'm going to try to show you in real life what it means for an, a vaccine to be effective. And then I'm gonna summarize for you the vaccine effectiveness. This slide is straight from the trial from the Pfizer vaccine. So imagine this axis, the y-axis being the cumulative number of people who've gotten uh, COVID disease and the x-axis being days. There were two arms to the trial. One arm got a placebo, which is just you know no vaccine, just felt like a vaccine. The other got the actual vaccine. So go to the next slide, please. Is it? So in the first few days, the placebo group is gonna be in brown. The vaccine group is in blue. Next slide. So this is up to seven days. This is up to 14 days. Next slide. Now you can start seeing that these, every dot here is cases of COVID in the placebo group who didn't get the vaccine and then the vaccine group. Keep going. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So what you see is that in 
uh, people who got the placebo, not the vaccine, more and more and more of those individuals out of the 35, 40,000 got COVID disease, including severe disease. The people who got the actual vaccine after this amount, like around seven days, now they have, everybody got two doses. Almost nobody got COVID disease. That's what it means. The next slide. And that translates to 95% effective. That's what it means when we say that a vaccine is 95% effective in preventing disease. So next slide, please. So what about the vaccine effectiveness of different vaccines? The Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective in preventing any disease. And it's even more effective in preventing severe disease like hospitalizations. It can be given over age 16, not 18, 16, and it's two doses. The Moderna vaccine, a very similar type of mRNA vaccine, also 95% effective, at least 90% 90 effective in preventing severe disease. And that's what really counts, right? Preventing severe disease. It can be given for over 18. The Janssen vaccine is not in bold because it hasn't been approved yet. Uh, you may have heard that it, it's around 66% effective overall. I'll talk more about it. But against severe disease, it's 85 to 90% effective, just about as effective as the other vaccines. And we don't know yet because we haven't analyzed the data very, very carefully. This is incredible amount of effectiveness for vaccines. It's about as effective as the, these are about as effective as the measles vaccine. Next slide. This is the rate at which the US adult population might get the vaccines. Um, so here's the dates. And this is the percent of the US adult population. And so you can see by, it, you know, if the rollout occurs the way we hope, and if people actually get the vaccine, in other words, want the vaccine, you by, you know, August, maybe 50% of the adult population by December, 70%. Next slide, please. Now we do not know what levels are needed for herd immunity, which would protect the whole population, but it's probably higher than 75%. But by 75%, I mean 75% of people who've either gotten the vaccine or have already had COVID. And a high proportion of people have already had COVID. So I don't know when we'll reach herd immunity, um, um, but it may be somewhere around here. Now this is barring, this is, um, if the mutations, the new variants don't really take over. And uh, Dr. Garner will talk about that. Next slide. So here I wanna show you this rollout, this stage rollout. Um, I was on the ACIP uh, group that made these decisions about who gets the vaccines early, who gets them later. And this was uh, what I call a Solomon's choice. It was an awful, awful, awful decision to make because we had to prioritize some people over other people when we knew that everybody would need the vaccine, but this was all because of the scarcity of the vaccine. So the decisions we made um, were to first prioritize healthcare personnel and, law, and individuals in long-term care facilities like nursing homes to preserve the healthcare system and because those individuals were the, um, uh, the most frail as there's 24 million people. The next stage where we are in right now is frontline essential workers, persons over 75 and persons over 65, and there's 77 million of those individuals. And I know um, in California, we are just entering the next phase. These numbers are a little bit different than what California uses, but this is what's used nationally, is persons with high risk conditions and other essential workers. And this is 101 million. So we're somewhere around here right now, and teachers and childcare workers are now eligible. For the vaccine. So next slide. And this is the rollout as of today or yesterday. 300, there's a 330 million people adult uh, in the United States, 264 million adults over age 16. The vaccine's not approved for under 16. So, so far there's been 82 million doses distributed, 65 million doses administered, 45 million have gotten one dose, 24, 20 million people have gotten two doses. So that's 17% of people over age 18 already have gotten one dose and 8% have gotten two doses. So despite all of the you know, concerns about how you know, the rollout has not gone the way we planned, um, it's ramping up. It's really ramping up. We're giving about 1.4 million doses a day across the United States. Next slide, please. All right, now all of this in terms of, remember that curve I showed about how many adults uh, uh, can get 
what percentage will get the vaccine. That assumes people will want the vaccine. So what about COVID vaccine hesitancy? Next slide, please. I've been involved with a, a group that's been surveying adults across the United States about um, what they say about are they likely to get a coronavirus vaccine if available. It's a random national, uh, nationally representative uh, sample across the United States. We survey them actually every two weeks about all sorts of things about coronavirus, but including the vaccine. The y-axis here shows the percent of individuals who said that they would like they would get the vaccine back in April, and then here's the results all the way until early January. And I, um, I just um, we, we have more recent results, but it hasn't changed. So next slide, please. What you can see is that there's been actually a decline since April. It hit bottom right around the election. And there's been a little bit of a rise, but I mean like a little bit of a rise. It's maybe up to 60% right now in, uh, in February. Next slide. So that's everybody. What about subgroups of the population? So the gray line shows everybody. The green line shows men and the blue line shows women. So what you could see is that women are actually less likely to want to get the vaccine than men. That's actually different than some other vaccines. And we can talk about that in the question and answer period if you want. Next slide. What about by age? So I think this is a little bit good news, bad news. Older individuals who are more at risk for COVID are more likely to want the vaccine. Younger individuals like 18 to 49, um, and my guess is there's many of you out of the 500 people who are on this call who are, who are in this age group um, are far less likely to get the vaccine. So that's kind of the bad news. And by the way, there's so far, some of these individuals have gotten the vaccine and there's a super high correlation in what they say and what they actually do among those who are eligible. So next slide, please. What about by education level? If you've had a bachelor's degree or more, you're much more likely to want the vaccine than high school education or less. So that has implications in terms of the, our messaging, right? Next slide. This is a really concerning slide for me. By race and ethnicity, there's enormous disparities in the likelihood of people wanting a vaccine. Among Asians, 77%, white, 59%, <clears throat> Hispanic, 56%, but among black individuals, only 40% indicate that they want the vaccine. Next slide, please. And this is very complicated, but this is broken up by um, types of health, uh, of um, occupation, employment. So the red is healthcare personnel. This isn't all doctors or nurses. This is anybody who works in a healthcare industry. You can see there's not much of a difference between them and everybody else. The green is you all. It's frontline is, um, well, either the green, yes, the green is, is frontline non-healthcare worker, essential workers. That's you all. You're frontline because you're exposed and you're an essential worker. So it's pretty much the same as everybody else, right around 58, 60%. Next slide, please. So what is this about vaccine hesitancy? I just want to um, point out that vaccine hesitancy is not an all or none concept. Um, there's a continuum of vaccine hesitancy. So most people accept all vaccines and will accept and want the COVID vaccine. Some people have very entrenched beliefs uh, and are anti-vaccinators, but a lot of people are in between. They refuse or they delay. They want to maybe get it, but in the future or they're unsure. And this is all understandable. It's all understandable. Next slide. And I want to show you what some different sources of influence are on the likelihood of getting a vaccine. And I'm not going to be able to get deep into why people are hesitant, but we can talk about that in the question and answer period. So if you trust, if you trust, and I'm going to say one more time, if you trust the vaccine development and approval process, you're going to get the vaccine. It basically um, accounts for all of the differences that I showed you above. If you trust mainstream media, media you're likely to get the vac more likely. If you trust healthcare experts, if you trust your phys what the physician says about COVID, you're much more likely to get the vaccine. If you trust social media or your work or your family, there's not a clear trend. Next slide. So there are hints for interventions here about this, and this, uh, and this all is embodied in trust. How much do I trust what people are telling me? How much do I trust the people who are telling me? Um, and so I think there's some hints for interventions about using the media, 
tap into influencers, tap into your physicians, tap into educators to talk to parents, tap into leaders of education. So just think about this. It, it's for COVID vaccine, a little bit different than other vaccines, hesitancy is all about trust. Next slide, please. All right, I was asked to talk a little bit about pediatric COVID vaccines since we all take care of children. So right now, the vaccine could be given for over 16. Um, the drug companies are actually studying already age 12 and up, so 12 to 16. Those individuals are already in phase three trials and maybe by the summer, um, there may be an emergency use authorization. Doc, uh, Annabelle is gonna talk about uh, emergency use authorization, but we may be able to be vaccinating over 12 year olds by the summer, but um, I'm just guessing. There's also planning, they're, they're planning studies in five to 11 year olds starting in April or February or back in like this month, depending on the industry. And below five, there's some studies of pregnant women. Um, and there will be studies starting in late 2021, I believe. Now, importantly, fortunately, COVID disease is not common enough among young children. So we're going to, we're not going to have enough cases of COVID to be able to really say with perfect, you know, with complete confidence that these vaccines will, that the, based on the trials, that the vaccines protect children against getting COVID, what we will be able to say is that the vaccines give the same level of um, an immune response to the vaccine as, do, as it does for adults, and that the vaccines are safe. And that's called immunobridging. And then there will be a little bit of a leap to say that will protect against COVID disease. But it's not, it's, an, it's, an, it's a reasonable leap. It's not an unreasonable leap to say that. And that's how we're gonna have to judge COVID uh, vaccines for children. Next slide. And I only have a couple more slides. Actually, uh, can, I, can you go one more slide maybe? Because I think I had a couple more minutes than I thought. Next slide. So just two more slides. For COVID disease, um, this talks about COVID disease in children because I'm not sure any other people are gonna be talking about this. So persons aged less than 18 have the lowest reported incidence of COVID-19. The highest incidence is actually among 18 to 29 year olds, and the ones who are hesitant for the vaccine. They're the spreaders. It, it was also very high among 85 and over because of nursing homes. And honestly, we've taken care of most of that because most of them are vaccinated. This is the incidence for five to 17 year olds. And this is the incidence for zero to four year olds, much, like, much less likely to get the, to get the disease. Having said that, 3 million children have tested positive. It's 13% of all COVID cases. And severe illness among children is rare, but more than 270 children have died from COVID this year. That's far more, far more than the number of children who die of influenza. Children under age five are less likely to get COVID-19. And if they get it, they're less likely to get sick from it. And because of all of this, the American Academy of Pediatrics and many organizations recommend in-person education, in-person education with all of the safety precautions that you all um, have been learning about and know about. Next slide. And then we'll just go back to. So what about COVID-19 and preschools or childcare settings? It turns out the studies show that there's very little spread of coronavirus in preschools among preschools that follow the guidelines, the safety precautions. There was a big study of childcare providers who tested positive for COVID-19, and there didn't seem to be an uh, association between whether they were working in an in-person child care program or not. In other words, they, the, the adults who got COVID-19 got it from home and not from the childcare setting. And a recent commentary in JAMA, which is a big journal, suggested that the, that you may know that COVID-19 spreads very quickly and strongly among jails and congregate living facilities, but not in school settings. Most transmission that occurs is in homes and not in school settings. Having said that, there's some activities that lead to greater risk like athletics. And, and, and so for, these are all the reasons that um, we're recommending safe opening of schools, but continuing current school policies for safety. And then obviously, in my opinion, teachers should get all the, uh, all teachers should get the vaccine. And go up two slides, please. And I think that was my, yep, that's my last slide. Thank you. You can go up one more slide. 
So I think it's actually Annabelle's turn. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my slides. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to do so. All right, can you all see them? Okay, great. So I am going to talk about a few things. One is side effects after the first vaccine dose and after the second vaccine dose. And I'll, um, since I'm talking about the two dose vaccines, um, I won't talk about the Johnson Johnson because as Dr. Salaji said, we still need to review the FDA data that they've submitted on side effects as well as uh, waiting for the FDA approval. And then I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the timeline of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So when are you infectious and how long are you infectious? Because this uh, commonly comes up and one of my roles is infection prevention uh, and determining when people are infectious and how to prevent the spread of diseases in the hospital. So as Dr. Salaji mentioned, you know, the safety of vaccines is really a top priority. We want to be sure that the vaccines that we're giving are safe and that there is uh, following the same safety standards as other vaccines that are given in the United States. So before the vaccine is authorized, the FDA carefully reviews all of the safety data from the clinical trials that the vaccine manufacturers have uh, performed. And the ACIP, which is a group that Dr. Salaji is a member of, reviews all of that safety data before recommending the use of those vaccines. All of this is done very, very carefully. The uh, Johnson vaccine, for example, was uh, submitted their data on February 4th, but that data is being reviewed um, on February 26th by the FDA, meaning they had several weeks to review all of the data in a lot of detail. And after the vaccine is authorized, both the FDA and the CDC closely monitor vaccine safety and side effects to make sure that there wasn't anything that's coming up that uh, did not come up in the clinical trial. So every vaccine is studied this way, and this is something um, that has been going on for a long time. We hear a lot about emergency use authorization and vaccines, and this is what's being used to authorize these vaccines for use. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So this occurs when there's a public health emergency that's declared in the United States. And when it's declared, the FDA determines that the known potential benefits of a product when used to diagnose, prevent, or treat serious or life-threatening diseases outweigh the known and potential risks of that product. So that means before they authorize the vaccine, they want to make sure that the benefits vastly outweigh the risks. Um, this involves a, a discussion with the Department of Health and Human Services secretary, the FDA commissioner, a discussion, discussion with the NIH, CDC, other research organizations before the emergency use authorization is administered. So it's really a very long, lengthy process. Um, typically for authorizing uh, medications or vaccines that's just uh, sped up a little bit, but without any skipping of any steps or review of safety. As I mentioned, the monitoring of these vaccines and vaccine safety is a regular ongoing part of vaccine development. There's a lot of systems that are in place, um, including systems like VAERS, where you can report if you have a side effect from a vaccine, vaccine safety data link, uh, which uses uh, insurance data to look at na national trends in millions of people to see if there are any trends in vaccine adverse effects. CISA, which is, a organiz which is a group of vaccine experts at CDC who monitor all of these adverse effects to determine if there's a link between vaccines. And then uh, the BEST system, which also looks at vaccine safety data. And these look at vaccine safety data before and after uh, vaccines have been licensed. In addition, for the COVID-19 vaccine, CDC created an app called VSAFE 
And this app, after you've received your vaccine, sends you text messages to check in to see if you're having any symptoms. And you can actually report any symptoms that you're having through this app. And those uh, symptoms are actually sent to the VAERS system so that they can be monitored to see if any of these um, adverse events are serious and need more follow-up. So really it's um, something that uh, CDC created that's much more user-friendly. I got um, my vaccine uh, a couple months ago and I've been receiving these VSAFE uh, text message apps to monitor um, if I'm having any symptoms. So one thing I'd like to briefly talk about is the side effects. So COVID vaccine re vaccines um, are reactogenic, meaning that you can get symptoms after you get a shot and that's totally normal. Um, and these reactogenic um, symptoms are things like a sore arm, muscle and joint aches, um, fever, uh, fatigue, headache, fever. And then there are things that we um, also monitor, which are more adverse events or safety issues. And these would be any issues that are medically important um, and attributed to the vaccine. And fortunately, um, we have not seen these with uh, the COVID vaccines. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So most of the symptoms after vaccines have occurred are pain at the site of the vaccine. And that is true for all vaccines. Typically that goes away um, and people don't have uh, severe side effects. More commonly um, in individuals who are less than 64 years of age who've had a second dose of the vaccine, um, they might get fatigue, headache, fever, and chills. Um, and most commonly what they get actually are fatigue in about 70% of those individuals, but they might also get some headache or fever, chills, and again, this typically goes away. Occasionally, some people might get swelling of their lymph nodes. Um, you get the injection in your arm, upper arm. You might get some lymph node swelling in that same arm after you've received the vaccine. Again, it's very uh, self-limited. One thing we've heard a lot about, though, is concern about anaphylaxis or serious allergy reactions to the vaccine. Fortunately, these adverse events are very rare. They're thought to occur less than five per million doses. Um, so very, very rare. And all of the cases uh, that were recently published in a medical journal of serious reactions, actually, all of those individuals had recovered. All of the sites um, that are administering vaccines should have an anaphylaxis kit on site to make sure that if somebody does have a serious reaction to the vaccine that they can address that immediately. It's also recommended that if you have a history of severe aller allergy to um, medications that you talk to your doctor um, or your allergist immunologist before you receive the vaccine. If you have a history of allergies um, to food or to pets that really aren't as severe, um, you actually are recommended to receive the vaccine, but should probably watch, be watched for about 30 minutes after you receive it to make sure that you aren't having an allergic reaction. And really, again, these allergies are really um, very rare. It typically occurs due to an allergy to um, one uh, component of the vaccine. Uh, pegosphereogenase, which is typically um, not in a lot of other medications. And again, an allergy to that component is typically uh, rare. Next, I'm going to talk briefly about infection with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 and kind of the timeline of that, um, just because we've been getting some questions about that. So this graph demonstrates um, the, kind of the natural history of infection with COVID. So first you're exposed. Um, typically the time period between uh, when you're exposed and infectious or develop symptoms is about five to seven days, meaning that you might be exposed to someone with COVID and generally five to seven days later, if you're going to get sick, you would get sick and you would test positive for COVID-19. However, some people might test positive or be infectious a little bit earlier. So you can um, be infectious as early as two days after your exposure. And some people might be infectious uh, much later. So some people might be infectious up to 14 days um, after they were exposed. 
The other thing is you may um, be exposed and then not develop symptoms for five to seven days, but actually before your symptoms start, you can be infectious. So there's a 48 hour window where you um, might be infectious before you actually uh, develop symptoms, which is why when you're exposed, it's important to quarantine for the entire time, even if you don't have symptoms. You also um, should isolate for 10 days after your symptoms start or after you have a positive test if you're exposed and didn't uh, develop symptoms. And that's because you're typically infectious during this 10 day window um, when your symptoms start. And after that, um, you're typically considered recovered. Some of this does depend on your immune status or if you had severe disease, uh, it's recommended that you isolate for about 20 days um, if you had severe disease or if you have uh, a, an immune uh, compromising condition. The other thing to note is that some people might continue to test positive even if it's been more than 10 or 20 days after they've recovered from COVID because uh, some, some individuals might still have virus in their nose and might still test positive for COVID-19, even though they aren't necessarily infectious. So it's one thing to consider if, um, for example, you have COVID-19 test positive and then a month later you're completely um, without symptoms and you test positive again, um, the likelihood is that you uh, recovered from your illness but still have the virus in your nose. Um, I've seen some questions in the chat about reinfection, which we can address later, kind of talk about, but most cases of people who continue to test positive after they've had COVID um, are actually due to just the virus being present um, in their nose and not necessarily reinfection. So after you've been exposed to somebody with COVID-19, um, typically what we recommend doing is if you've been within six feet of that person for 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period, it's recommended that you follow your local public health guidelines for quarantining. Usually that means uh, quarantining for 10 to 14 days after your exposure. And typically it's recommended that you test seven days after um, exposure, even if you don't have symptoms and that you continue to quarantine for about 10 days. Some of this does vary based off of your local public health department. Each public health department might have their own guidelines for how long you need to quarantine. And some of this might also depend on whether or not you're considered an essential worker or a healthcare worker. So I would recommend if you are exposed to someone with COVID-19 that you go to your county healthcare department's uh, website and look up the recommendations for quarantine. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and pass uh, the um, mic over to Dr. Garner. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. De St. Maurice. Uh, thank you, Head Start, for having us here to talk. So I've been tasked to talk about the mutants and the variants. And so I don't have a slideshow. I just want to go over what is a COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 mutant? How does it make variants? And, you know, these words are in the media all the time, right? How concerned should we be about the variants that are there? Will our vaccine still work? So I kind of in the next 10 minutes want to tackle as much of that as possible. And then of course, leave room and welcome questions at the end, because I will acknowledge this is a complicated topic, right? I don't think we in general spend our time as public thinking about viral mutants. I mean, I do, but I think generally we don't think about viral mutants and mutant strains and all of these things. So, you know, I, I, I think you want to give yourself a little room that it is very complicated and I'm glad that you've signed on to learn more about it. So in order to have a conversation about viral mutants and viral variants, I want to first talk about the virus itself. So the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2. And viruses are really composed of two different separate pieces. Viruses are composed of proteins. And those proteins are found along the outside of the virus and sometimes within the virus. And they really help the virus infect a cell and be able to make new virus. So you can think of them kind of as the action arms of viruses. Viruses are also composed of a genome, which are the genetic instructions for the virus. And for SARS-CoV-2 or for the virus that causes COVID-19, it's held in RNA. 
So you can think of RNA as the instructions for this particular virus. So when a virus infects a cell, it uses those instructions to allow the cell to make new virus. And in an ideal world, it would make an exact genetic copy. So a virus would infect a cell and all of the virus that then comes out of that cell, which is happening during this infectious process, would be the exact same virus. In the real world, that's not exactly what happens. So when that virus is making a copy of itself, small changes will occur in the RNA, and these are called mutations. These mutations lead to a slightly different virus after that virus infects a person. Sometimes these mutations are big. Big mutations don't really lead to virus that can live, but sometimes these mutations are very, very small. But just know that it's a natural part of virus biology that every time it replicates, it can make some of these small changes. These are the changes that then lead to variants of the virus that are different from other variants. So for example, we have a UK variant. The UK variant of the virus is the, COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19 that's most often found right now in the UK. These are separated geographically because as variants take over, they replicate within a population. And so there's a South African variant, there's a Brazilian variant, there is even a California variant that you may have read about recently in an article in the LA Times. And so questions come up about these particular variants. Now, I want to go back to the virology just a little bit more and talk about the spike protein. So remember, we talked about the proteins that are found on the outside of the virus. The most important protein for the virus that causes COVID-19 is the spike protein. You can think of this protein as it allows the virus to infect cells. And the more quickly it can infect cells, the easier it can cause disease, it can be more contagious, it can cause even a higher death rate. And so really, it's all about the spike protein. Our vaccines are also based on the exposure of the spike protein to the immune system. So that antibody response that you make, that protective immunity that you make, is actually targeted against that very, very important spike protein. And this is all going to become important to discuss in the concepts of the variants. So we talked a little bit about mutation. We are concerned with a lot of the different mutations that happen in the virus that causes COVID-19 or COVID-19 virus, but we are concerned with mutations that happen in the spike protein specifically. Because mutations that happen in the spike protein specifically, and this is what we're seeing amongst the variants that exist, can cause changes to the virus that allow us to have to respond to the virus differently. So what does that mean specifically? So I like to think of these changes as in four very broad questions that we're going to handle one one at a time. So a new variant shows up. One, will it cause increased disease? Is it more contagious? Is it more likely to make you sick? Two, will the variant cause increased death? So if people show up to the hospital, are they more likely to die because of that particular variant? Three, will our tests still, still work? And remember, this is critical for me because we end up running, my lab runs the clinical microbiology testing for COVID-19 at UCLA. So if the tests don't work anymore, that's a problem. And four, which is kind of the million dollar question, will our vaccines continue to work on the variants? So let's handle those each one at a time. So first, does it cause an increase in disease? Since the very beginning of this outbreak, December 2020 moving, December 2019 moving through 2020 and into 2021, we have seen variants that have caused increased disease. So for example, the UK variant. The UK variant took over in London and then spread throughout Europe very quickly. And that is because there were changes in the spike protein, mutations in the spike protein that allowed it to become more contagious and made people potentially more infectious when they had it. So you saw it spread very, very quickly. There have been other variants that have gone down that line as well. So yes, we know there are variants that can cause disease more quickly. The second question, and this is a complicated question, is does it cause more death? More death, higher mortality is a little bit tricky, right? Because with this particular disease, maybe a variant causes more death because it's more likely to infect sort of the deeper lung and cause pneumonia, or maybe it overall appears to cause more death because more people are being infected. 
Thus, the people who are most at risk in the population end up catching that particular variant. That's a complicated issue and that is still being worked out for each individual variant. So those are the two patient sides, right? Is it more contagious? Will it cause more death? Now, when we move into the testing side, our PCR tests, which are tested, you've heard of the gold standard test, actually look for different parts of that genome of the virus or those instructions of the virus. So if you have a mutation in one of the areas that the test is looking, then potentially the test could end up being a false negative, meaning the variant caused the test to not work anymore. This is very concerning and it's something that we are always on the lookout for. Anytime there's a new variant, we go through a series of tests to make sure that our PCR tests, our diagnostic tests will still work. And I'm happy to say at this time, because we use multiple targets for these tests, there has yet to be a variant that stops our diagnostic tests from working. So we are still able to trust the results and diagnose this disease accurately. Finally, and again, to the million dollar question and the one people are asking the most, will the vaccine still work? So why is this a concern? So our vaccines, as I mentioned before, are based on creating the spike protein and then having protective immunity. I do this because you got the shot in the arm. Creating the spike protein with the shot in the arm and then creating that protective immunity from that particular shot. So if there are mutants or variants that change that spike protein enough, the antibodies that you made to that original spike protein that was found in the vaccine may not work anymore. The case in point here is why you need a flu shot every year. So the reason you need a flu shot every year is that that virus mutates so much as it makes its way around the world to the next year that basically the next year, it's an all new flu. And so it has changed itself so that protective immunity that you got last year no longer works. You can almost think about it as a new flu virus. This is really going to be the question with the variants that exist right now. Will we have a new enough variant, a variant that has changed to that spike protein enough that the vaccines are no longer going to be effective? I like to describe this as a vaccine escape mutant. Now, we don't know if there's going to be a vaccine escape mutant. And I will say this, the more infection there is, the more likely that the virus is able to replicate, the more viral replication there is, the more likely that these variants will show up. So really our first battle, and Dr. Fauci has said this as well, let's bring down the overall amount of infection because if there's less infection, there's less viral replication, there's less chance for the variants. But we do have some tests that we can run to be able to determine whether or not the antibodies that are created against the vaccine product spike protein will still protect against the new variants. Some of these are run in a laboratory. They're called neutralization assays. And what I will say for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, and this was very good, that there has not been a viral variant, so one of these mutants in the spike protein, that has made the antibodies created from those vaccines entirely ineffective. There's been some reduction, but there hasn't been a complete ineffectiveness. So the assumption there is that there will still be coverage based on that particular vaccine product. But you have to keep testing, right? We now have a California variant that's dominant in California. We need to test that variant against the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine products. Once the, once the Johnson & Johnson vaccine gets produced, that then needs to be tested against the variant. So this is an ongoing challenge. As long as we're in the midst, and this is a global challenge, as long as we're in the midst of a global pandemic and the virus is changing and there are new variants, those variants will have to continually be tested. Now, as far as vaccines go, there's another piece of good news is that vaccines don't just rely on antibodies to work. Vaccines also rely on something called T cells that provide protection. And those T cells may not be quite as susceptible to changes in the spike protein. So that level of flexibility will also hopefully provide some level of protection if the variants don't work against the antibodies for the vaccine. So again, we haven't had that, we haven't seen that yet, but that is still in play. And so I am, as a virologist, as a clinical microbiologist who studied viruses for most of my career, cautiously optimistic that if we can bring down the overall amount of infection, 
we can actually fight against the variants and the tools that we have now will continue to work. But this is a critical time. This is a time, and this is why I really like these levels of education. You know, one thing that is important is vaccine uptake, because the more people that take the vaccine, the less likely we're going to have these variants continue to show up because the replication will come down, the mutation will come down. So all of this is tied in well together, and it's something that we are continually looking at. Again, it's a hard topic to cover sort of in more detail, but I'm more than happy to answer any additional questions that you may have. And I'm happy to pass this over to Dr. Salagi to continue our conversation. Hi, now I'm gonna try to share my screen. Actually, I don't wanna share that. What did I share? Uh, let me stop share and try this again. This is the first time I think Peter and I have actually ever shared a stage together in 35 years of marriage. <laughs> and um, I'm hoping you can all see the screen. Well, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to put myself into slideshow. Still okay? All right. Um, and just see if I can minimize some stuff here so I can actually see my own slides. That would be a good thing. Um, uh, and I have to back up just a little bit. So I'm going to take us off in a little bit of a different um, direction. Um, because one of the things that you all as um, Head Start and early Head Start folks are going to have to be doing is helping children with transitioning back from being at home to being um, in a program, um, or if you're doing home-based care um, and have been doing that virtually, having you show up at their houses again. And, and it's not just the children who'll be transitioning um, to childcare schools and early education, um, it's going to be their, their parents also. And there's probably gonna be some combination of relief and anxiety and so helping children and the families through these transitions um, is something that you as early um, childhood educators actually already know an awful lot about. So I show this uh, slide to say that, that transitions are challenging. Ch change is difficult for all of us. Um, and we have a range of children. And in the work that I do, we describe children as ranging from dandelions to orchids. Um, the dandelion child is the child that you can put pretty much anywhere and they will somehow thrive. Um, they're very adaptable. And at the other extreme, we have our orchids who are more fragile and need more care and more reassurance. And, but we have lots of flowers in our garden of children and each one is of course different. And children have lots of responses to transition, um, like the little girl in the upper right there she's obviously pretty shy. The child in the lower right is very fearful and the young man to the left is just taken over the world as he rushes back in the door to um, his childcare setting. But children are gonna range from excitement into separation anxiety. And I know that you're already as early childhood folks probably pretty used to dealing with that um, and, and responding to the different children that come, with you, that come to you. Um, and some of our children though, after this year out of services are going to be used to hanging out with their parents all the time. And they're going to need some reintroduction and gentle easing in. And usually we would have the parents stay for a while and slowly allow the teacher to engage the child and then slowly let the parent leave. This is going to be much harder to do with COVID where children are going to be dropped off, not really welcome to come inside. Um, unless there's amazing space inside your facility um, and where everybody's going to be masked and there's going to be pickup at the other end of the day, again, probably without having um, parents enter unless there's a safe space for them to do that. And if there is, then it's probably a good idea to set up that transition zone uh, and not let it get too crowded. Um, and you may have to stagger your start times a little bit. Um, it helps, I think, to transition children if we have something really interesting going on. Um, so using the art of distraction, which I know you're all familiar about. So if there's somebody playing music or doing some dancing or reading nearby or blowing some bubbles, 
to kind of move kids out of that entryway and toward their um, teacher, that would be good. But their parents are also going to be having some difficulties and their um, reactions to bringing their child back to early Head Start or Head Start may be relief. Oh, you know, finally my child's back in program, I'll be able to resume my work or other things in my life. Um, or to fear, worry about their child getting infected or their child bringing um, disease home. There's going to be orientation to all those new guidelines that you're going to have to put in place around masking and distancing and who can be present in your environment at any point in time. And visiting, gathering, meals, won't be family style meals, um, and maybe hiring some extra staff who the kids aren't familiar with. So the thing about stress is it activates our stress responses. And these are very primitive biological responses that all of us have. When we are faced with something that is, appears threatening, our, our stress response systems fire off. That immediate response is not something we control. We can sometimes get it under control in a moment when we realize it's not a big threat, um, but it is a reflex response. It's not a decision that we make. Um, and, it's this, and it's designed to help us respond to a threat. When we all lived in the wilderness, we really needed this response to help us survive. Um, and we still have those same um, stress responses. They're built into our biology and they are built into the biology of our children. These are some of the early, kids are born with their stress responses intact. And we all recognize the physical symptoms in ourselves when we get triggered um, and we call it fight or flight. We might feel hot or sweaty, our heart might race, we might feel anxious. And another response that we might have besides fight or flight, and it's also a stress response, is to freeze. And this is the deer caught in the headlights. And sometimes children will have this response. They'll freeze or they'll hide um, in order to escape what they perceive as a threat or danger. And even a minor change for some children, those orchids can be very stressful. And what feels like easy or relief or even fun for a parent or an adult may appear distressing to a child. What looks like a kitten to us might look like a mountain lion um, to them. But fortunately, as humans, we have another stress response that really doesn't get talked about very much, but it's also built into our biology. And it's probably the reason that we've survived as a species. It is called the affiliate response. And it is mediated by a different hormone um, than the ones that trigger the fight or flight or the freeze responses. It is, that hormone is called oxytocin. And just as you and I rely on our partners or friends to help us manage a bad day at work or the loss of a loved one or the stresses of life, Children rely on the presence of an emotionally available nurturing caregiver in order to help them handle stress. This is the most helpful thing that children have in times of stress. And you all work with young children, so you know they are so cued into their parents or the other adult caregivers in their life that they very quickly tune into our moods and into whether we are stressed or whether we are distracted, which is when your child decides to act up to get your attention, um, or whether we're not caring, or whether we are paying attention um, to what their needs are. And they're very attuned to our distress. And if we are distressed and show it, they are going to feel unsafe or stressed and whammo, they're back in fight or flight or hide. So for the affiliate response to work, the child has to feel safe. This is fundamental. And as adults, we all know that if we don't feel safe, we're not gonna share our concerns or our hopes or our dreams with another person. We have to feel psychologically um, and physically safe with another person in order to do that. And in fact, we encircle ourselves as adults with those that we do feel psychologically and physically safe with. So here are some things that I, as a pediatrician anyway, um, teach parents, especially parents who are dealing with um, children with behavior issues or stress. Um, some of the things I talk to them about, one is being an emotional container. And you all probably already know how to do a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about. You may just never have thought about them quite this way 
before. When children are stressed, they are actually in the lower part of their brain where their alarm system is. And that is that reflex part of the brain that tells them that they are in danger. And their thinking and learning brain, that front part of the brain is basically offline. As adults, we help children when we can remain calm, when we can be a container for those strong emotions, when we get down to their eye level, we speak gently, we reassure them they're okay, that mommy's coming back right after snack or reading time. Even if they don't understand the words, they get the tone of voice, they get the look on our face, they get the fact that we're tuned into them. We're using that affiliate response when we do this. This actually calms the fight or flight response. In some kids, you see it happen very quickly. Other kids may take several minutes in order to move from that lower part of their brain back into their thinking and learning brain. We are helping a child to regulate their emotions and their behaviors in response to stress. And this process is called co-regulation. And as early childhood educators, you do this all the time with children. And regulation is one of what we call the three R's. Um, these are three wonderful approaches that you're already using with your own kids probably and the kids that you'll soon ba be back working with in person. Um, you provide reassurance that they are safe. And as adults with children, we do this in all sorts of different ways. We provide routines which create a sense of predictability and security for children. And then this regulation or co-regulation. So there's a lot going on in this picture. This adult, who's presumably the dad, is reassuring this child that they are safe through words and touch, which helps reduce the child's stress responses, allows the child to calm and regulate. And that adult is probably also using some words to build emotional vocabulary skills or will once the child has calmed down. The worst time to try to teach a child anything is when they're in a full-blown uh, meltdown. Kids can't use their words until we teach them those words. And so it is up to us as adults to teach them the words of feelings and emotions. And most younger children, as you probably know, know about four words for feeling. It's like having the four pack of crayon colors to draw the human experience when you would much rather have that 64 color pack of crayons. So the four words kids learn um, in childhood are happy, sad, scared, and mad. And um, some kids will learn the word angry instead of mad. But it really is our job to teach them that there are other colors or words for feelings. So when they're calm, we can say, I see you felt sad and a little worried when daddy left. So you've offered empathy, you've given a child words for their feelings, and you have helped them to um, move back into their thinking and learning brain and routines. Parents um, can do things, and you probably already do this in your early childhood settings. You can put picture charts up of what the day is going to look like or for very specific routines around lunchtime or bedtime. Um, and at school, it's often first we do welcome, then we do playtime, then we do reading, then we do snack. Um, and using with young children, of course, that's best done in pictures. Um, we adults actually this year all got to experience what it is like when unexpected transitions occur, when COVID hit and we all, all of a sudden, um, our lives were completely disrupted. All of our normal routines were disrupted. Work, school, visiting friends, family, shopping. We all had to establish new routines and find a new equilibrium. This is the same thing you're gonna be helping children to do when they restart their Head Start programs. And routines create this amazing sense of security because they create predictability for children. And it's why in medicine, we urge getting back to routines for meals, play and sleep after natural disasters or any other major changes in a family. It's a return to the familiar, or if it's slightly different, at least the almost familiar, and it gives children a lot of reassurance. Preparing children for transitions is also important. Some people think that children are too young to know I'm bringing them to daycare today or I'm bringing them to their early Head Start program. But having a routine at home that prepares a child for a transition 
talking about it, even if you think they don't understand it. Um, and such things as packing up the backpack, setting out the clothes, having routines for the morning and getting in the car and going to, to your program or you know, wh whether you take public transportation or drive there um, or walk there in some lucky situations. Um, and then in school, of course, prepping kids for transitions again and referring to those charts to help them along. And some kids, as you all know, do this quite easily and other kids need uh, quite a bit of encouragement to go along, especially if they're overly enjoying the activity they're already involved in. Um, but letting children know what's coming makes the adjustment easier um, for them. So calming the stress responses, this is another part of regulating. I refer a lot of parents to Sesame Street and communities. I even refer teenagers to Sesame Street and communities. There's a lot of wonderful things on their website about helping children who are feeling stressed. Elmo's belly breathing is just wonderful. And there's also something called Big Bird Safe Nest about setting up a safe place in a home or even in um, a childcare setting um, where children can just go and um, be quiet for a moment, maybe have some of their favorite little things there um, that calm them down. Because we as adults, we all have our own stress relieving activities, whether you like to take a walk or drink tea the way I do, um, or talk to a friend or listen to music or take a run. Um, and so we need to help our children learn what helps them um, to feel better. And a lot of these things like breathing and rhythmic motion, like swinging or having a quiet space set aside or exercising, um, we can help children figure out what works for them. And we can remind parents that they can do these activities with their children. And at home, going back at the end of the day is also going to be um, a re-entry period again. And again, some children get home and they're fine. They're just happy to be there. But other children um, need a little bit of re-entry time after being in any kind of educational program. And we have the active child who needs to run their energy out versus the very quiet child who might like to sit with a book um, or a snack for a few minutes. The one thing all kids need is some time in with their parent. Um, and we recommend that at least 15 minutes a day where the parent turns off all the electronic devices in the home could set a timer if they're very busy so that it dings at 15 to 20 minutes and just really focuses on the child in an activity that the child chooses um, or um, the parent you know, offers the child a range of choices. If they're very young, you can let a two-year-old pick you know, whether they wanna do a puzzle or they wanna build with some Legos. But this um, is a wonderful opportunity in which you build a parent-child relationship and the parent follows the child's lead in this. And children build a sense of self-efficacy through this and confidence um, and parents can just observe, oh, I like the way you put the red block on the blue block. I like, and, and a lot of our parents don't come with these skills. So spending a little time teaching them can be very helpful. Um, and we should also catch children mastering their new skills, whether that's saying their feelings because they've learned new words. Oh, I like the way that you were able to tell me that you're feeling sad today. Or whether they went to their quiet corner to calm themselves. Um, and we can also, as um, teachers and pediatricians, teach parents about being an emotional container, using reassurance and routines and co-regulation and teaching um, words for feelings. This work that you do every day, as Peter said at the beginning, is so crucial. The brain of the zero to five-year-old is growing faster than it's ever going to grow again. The second most active phase is puberty and adolescence. So what you put in at this age is just tremendous. And you already know a lot of this stuff. Um, and together, I'm hoping we can all help our little people just become the best they that they can become. Thank you so much. I have this top share. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. What a full, full webinar of information. Uh, and on my behalf in particular, thank you for speaking in terms that are so understandable for us to be able to translate and share with our both our colleagues, our families, and the parents that we serve. So 
great, great amount of information. We do have just a few questions, about uh, 30 of them. Uh, and I know that the questions have been available for you to uh, take a look at as we've gone along. I've got a few that I've picked out um, that I want to bring your to your attention. Um, but uh, Dr. Shalagi, uh, just at the very end there, there was a question about the three R's and I caught regulation and reassurance, but give us those three R's one more time. Yeah, reassuring the child that they're safe. So this means both psychological and physical safety. And we do that as parents and as educators in different ways, right? Sometimes it's as simple as saying, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe, um, especially for a child is at any kind of trauma. But it is also just being with them and being tuned into them and saying, you're okay, it's okay, mommy's going to be back later, uh, especially for children with um, separation anxiety. And I usually suggest, even if you know the kid doesn't understand that you're saying mommy will be back at the, you know, after we finish reading time this afternoon, still saying it because what they're tuning into is the look on your face and the tone of voice. So reassurance, routines. And, and that has to do with having well-established routines in your school that aren't rigid. You know, they have to remain somewhat flexible because things happen, but that are posted that the educator can refer to and kind of let the child know what's coming next. And, um, and then the third one is that co-regulation, um, which is, you know, we use reassurance and routines to help children with co-regulation, but then some of those other tricks like teaching them words for feelings, um, you know, getting down to eye level, remaining calm, speaking in that funny high-pitched voice we all use with kids. Um, and sometimes it doesn't matter so much what you're saying as the look on your face, the attention you are paying, and um, the kindness with which you are paying attention to that child. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one other question that came in directly for the association was on the topic of uh, whether the Office of Head Start will require staff to have a vaccination or require agencies to require that of staff. And we did speak with the regional office recently and they said the answer is no. At the national level, the Office of Head Start will not be requiring it. However, they will be looking to local grantees to make that decision and we'll expect that a plan is uh, that evolves with some consideration toward uh, the population served, the occupation of the individual staff and other uh, community health conditions. So for those of you who work in Head Start, you'll want to look to your local agency for specific direction on whether you are required a vaccine uh, to move forward in your work uh, in time. And in the um, list of questions from our attendees, there were a few on a uh, few about children. And one was, uh, what is the time frame for vaccines for children? And uh, Dr. Hoggy, Peter, you, I think you covered that a little bit. Do you want to? Yeah, we don't. Um, perhaps by the summer or so, there may be an emergency use authorization for children over age 12. Um, the way the way it works for most vaccines, and the way it's working for COVID vaccine. Um, if, it's a, if it's a disease like influenza, for example, or COVID that affects children and adults, the vaccines are usually tested on adults first to ensure that they're effective and safe. And then there's a step down by age. And that's, actually, and that's exactly what's going to happen. So maybe the summer um, for 12 and over, and then late 2021, perhaps for kids five to 12, um, I don't think in, in 2021 and in, in this year, I don't think we'll be getting um, even an emergency use authorization for children under age five. That's my guess. It's a little risky predicting the future with COVID, but that's, that's my guess. Right, right. Um, also a question came in regarding our family child care homes. As you know, Head Start, early Head Start in particular has a lot of partnerships with family child care. Those are settings for six to 14 children. Uh, what do we know about transmission and prevention in family child care home settings uh, where there's either one or two adult caregivers? What's, what's some of the recommendations around those smaller settings? We can talk a little bit about this. So um, in small settings, and especially where children are around, it does seem like children get infected less often than adults, um, and they're less likely to transmit to adults. So I think when you have settings where you have different households together, which I think is what you're describing, um, it's recommended that you try to have 
as many people as possible when you're indoors to, to have them wear masks and practice the physical distancing. I realize probably in a lot of these settings, people are eating dinner together and um, uh, eating together. So obviously, so you can't wear a mask while you're doing those things. But as much as possible, if you can open the windows, it, um, particularly since, most of, since a lot of us, in, um, especially in California and Hawaii, can, can open those windows, um, open them in areas where you can't um, wear a mask at all times to try and improve the vent ventilation. Um, those are kind of you know, basic things that, that we recommend um, for, uh, for those types of settings. Other things are if somebody does get sick, um, has symptoms to try and get them tested as soon as possible so that um, they can isolate. Um, and then if they are COVID positive, then they can, um, everyone else can quarantine if necessary. So really trying to limit the time together and try and use those masks and improve ventilation as much as possible. Great, thank you for that. Uh, other additions to that, Can we move on? Let me, let me take then the next, and that is uh, getting the shot. There were some questions from folks in terms of timing. If they had had COVID, how long they should wait uh, till they uh, receive their vaccination, since a lot of our staff are being welcomed into that process now. Um, and there's also, also this question of the dose requirement uh, after this period of time, if there'll be that expectation, as uh, Dr. Garner was suggesting that kind of like the flu shot, would we see a uh, return to a shot every year type of thing? So nine, if you've had COVID, the recommendation is to wait 90 days um, for the first dose. Currently, it's still recommended to give two doses of vaccine if you've had COVID. Um, it may be a, in the future that may change because if you've had COVID, you probably have antibodies T cell, as Dr. Garner was talking about, you know, you have an immunological response to it. And in the future, maybe you'll only need one dose, but there's not quite enough data about that. ACIP, which is the group that decides on this, is actually reviewing that data right now. Um, but currently, it's recommended to get two doses, even if you have had COVID disease. Um, but that may change. And are we going to be in an era of COVID vaccines every year? I personally suspect we are. Um, but it may not be every year, I, you know, we just need data. I mean, one of the great things about the vaccine world is we really try to follow the data and establish studies to give us enough data to make these very important public health decisions that are going to affect um, pretty much everybody. Um, so we just don't, we just don't know. I don't know if others have thoughts about the annual question. Uh, you know, I, I will say that yeah, as, as the country has seen, vaccine rollout is complicated and making a vaccine can be complicated. But actually, once you have a vaccine, it's easier to include new variants into the next shot. And so while there may need to be a booster, you know, I tend to lean a little bit more optimistically, but who knows? No one really knows whether or not there's going to be enough mutation or variants to require a new vaccine. If there is, it is something that can be included. And I know it's something that Moderna and Pfizer are, are looking at now for the variants that are out there and that exist. And so while it's complicated as vaccine rollout is, my hope is that we can get to a point where if we do need a new vaccine, let's say yearly because of changes in the virus, then it could be made available on a widespread basis. That was one of the questions, is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine more equipped to address variants since it's coming out later? Is, is there anything to that uh, in the research? Yeah. That's actually a really good question. Um, and we have to remember that the first two vaccines, which are highly, highly effective, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, those studies were done late last year, between July and you know into November, before the variants. The Johnson Johnson vaccine was studied in a couple of different countries, including South Africa. A lot of those individuals in that trial were in South Africa. And a lot of those cases, those graphs were just like the way I was showing is, um, if you didn't get the vaccine, there were more and more cases of COVID. If you did get the vaccine, far, 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 far fewer. Um, that was in a setting where there were a lot of variants. So it's hard to compare those two because we don't know yet um, 
for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, is it actually better than Johnson Johnson vaccine? Because they, the tests were done at different times. Um, there's some budding evidence, increasing evidence that as Dr. Garner was saying that the Johnson, that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are going to be you know, effective with most many of these variants. Um, and, and so the answer was that the Johnson Johnson was tested during the variants. In fact, in the very country where there were a lot of, where, where one of the concerning variants exists and it showed um, some effectiveness, not as effective, but some effectiveness, significant amount of effectiveness. You know, we can't every, expect everything to be perfect. Seat belts are not perfect. Mm -hmm. People get hurt and die with seat belts, as we learned yesterday from a very famous person. Um, not everything is perfect. If we expect perfection from vaccines, we're expecting too much. Um, these vaccines are incredibly effective. They've been studied. They're really very safe. They've now been given in so many million people. We actually have a lot more safety data on these vaccines than we have on a lot of other vaccines. So, Good, good point. And a couple of questions just to bundle them together about access to vaccines that I, I believe it's true they are free and they are all, they're being distributed community-based that you do not need to go just to your insurance company for that, if you're a Kaiser member, you can get them elsewhere. And, uh, and so there is no real restriction uh, monetarily or any other way uh, on the access to them. Is, is that your sense as well? Yeah. Yeah. And well, do you want to talk about, do you want me to talk about it or? Um, I can just say, you know, here in California, for example, I saw one of the questions was about why do I have to bring my insurance card if um, the vaccine is free? So. Um, you know, it's free to you, but if your insurance, um, if the person providing the vaccine can bill your insurance, they will, but you won't see any cost. So just so that um, uh, you're aware of that. Um, but uh, yes, they are free. And I don't know if you have anything to add, Peter, to that. Yeah, just that the, the, they're given right now. I mean, they're, they're, they're given right now in two major types of sites. One is the large county sites and many counties like Los Angeles County have mobile units already and they've set up sites and communities as well as the mass vaccination centers. And then health systems is the, is the other one. And now they're rolling out into pharmacies, into, into large pharmacies. So that's actually going to help a lot uh, um, to, in terms of distributing vaccines. And um, I don't think it's gonna to be too far in the future that physicians offices um, are going to have some of these, it's some of these vaccines. They don't now, um, but, in the future, I think that's going to that's going to be the case. So there's going to be lots of opportunities to get these vaccines. Excellent. And you know, we have quite a few folks on here who are responsible for parent education. Uh, what would you recommend as some websites that you think are most uh, effective in terms of the, the materials they have on them, the way, information in which it's presented, and in particular, if you're aware of sites that have materials in Spanish. Yeah, I can. I know that the CDC has quite a few good references, and I can share them with you after this, um, just for education purposes. But one thing I will add is, all of you are have a close connection with so many of these families, and I would not underestimate that power. Um, I think that, you know, for those of us on this panel, we we certainly, you know, have spent a lot of time uh, studying vaccines and viruses and um, immunity, but um, the power that a personal connection has is really important. So when you're talking to these families, even though you may not be a vaccine expert or a virologist like Dr. Garner, it still is important um, that you talk to families and, and say, some of the things that you've heard, um, and I can share some of the CDC data because, as Dr. Salaji said earlier, that level of trust is really what's going to to get people to get the vaccine and protect themselves and their families. And when you're eligible to receive the vaccine, receive it. Talk to others about it. I, I try to do that myself. You know, tell them that I received the vaccine, didn't have any side effects, um, and I think that those types of personal stories and personal connections can really have a big impact. 
Great. Well, thank you. Well, we're just at the, the end of our time. I'm going to go ahead and close our webinar. First, again, uh, thanking the four of you for your expertise, your commitment to our, our children and families, to the work that we do. We uh, salute your expertise and appreciate you bringing that closer. Also for the attendees, just to remind you that we will do this again on March 18th. Uh, it'll be early in the day, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And we'll have a panel again to bring you the latest information on vaccine education. Uh, we will be focusing on uh, various communities that we've yet to touch with, such as Pacific Islanders, uh, tribal organizations, and the such. So uh, listen for the, or be watchful for the agenda to come out on that. And one more time, just to tell you, in probably about 24 hours, you'll be receiving an email from us with a certificate of pop uh, participation, a link to this webinar that'll be up on YouTube. So you can share that with your colleagues and friends. It's free and accessible to everyone. Um, and then any other questions that you have, feel free to reach out to the Region 9 Head Start Association and letting us know how best to serve you. And of course, last, my appreciation to my colleague, Chris Miracle with Head Start California for their commitment to bringing this great panel together for all of us to benefit. So thank each of you, have a good evening and uh, we look forward to a better health and uh, some good times ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.